So I'm in the unenviable position of being the last speaker between you and dinner, um, but and and talking about periodontal disease, um, and then I realized that I'm a friend of Mark's dentist. So there you have it. Um, so so um, <clears throat> this is. Uh, I'll try to be very very brief. Um, the periodontal microbiome working group was was uh, formed at the uh, last meeting, and um, <clears throat> this is this is uh, really in in response to some of the the missing data that we 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 have in terms of of um, predicting um, you know the, the the genetic risk or or risk to complex d d diseases. Uh, clearly, there's going to be environmental factors. And uh, among those um, uh, factors, uh, very important, is uh, microbiome. <clears throat> and so in, in, in working in, in looking at complex genetic disorders, uh, the, uh, characterizing the microbiome could help us stratify uh, some, some uh, subgroups of, of these patients. So, uh, and I've also been asked to, to, to um, look at, at potential demonstration pro projects. So, I'll talk about uh, one of those, which would be in the, in the dental context, uh, response to dental analgesics and uh, also to anticoagulants, uh, which, uh, you know, some patients are on and then they, they have to have oral surgery, so they have to go off of those. And so, you know, uh, what's the, what's the, um, Kind of half-life um, uh, from a genetic point of view for for uh, things like warfarin, and uh, clearly um, the microbiome and periodontal disease uh, in particular uh, has effects on complex diseases such as uh, uh, coronary artery disease potentially, and and certainly type two diabetes. So the goal of our working group was. Um, we set to, to establish uh, an oral systemic health research network, uh, a, and, and our aim then would be to share and pool patients and data across this network to advance translational medicine uh, and, and dental care. Uh, the process that we, uh, we focused on was to institute standards and best practices in, in setting this up. So we've had, uh, in addition to the, the, the last meeting, we've had two teleconferences. And we've had represent, uh, representatives from um, various organizations shown here, um, and I won't go into, you, you can see who that is. Um, and uh, among our discussions were, you know, in, inclusion and exclusion criteria for this, uh, expected sample sizes in, in these different, from our different um, uh, uh, centers, uh, how do we classify uh, parodontitis? Uh, the, n the types of oral uh, samples to be collected for microbiome analysis, um, and uh, timing of collection, et cetera. And again, for, for in, because we're running a little late, I won't go into it in, in great detail, other than to say that um, we're, we're close to settling on most of these. So um, for inclusion-exclusion criteria at the Marshfield Clinic, uh, these are some of um, our, um, our inclusion exclusion criteria and uh, importantly we want to make sure that these individuals um, have um, have both the, the electronic health record electronic dental record so that they they see our uh, our dentists and our uh, and have a primary care provider in our system and 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 um, haven't had antibiotic treatments in the past three months um, and I must say that uh, we've started um, recruitment and that seems to be going pretty well. Uh, at the Marshfield Clinic, we are interested in recruiting about 2,000 such patients. Um, our uh, definition for periodontitis um, is from the American Academy of Periodontology, um, a case classification system. Okay, so um, there is controversy about um, coronary artery disease, or more specifically, atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease uh, and, and, and uh, periodontal disease. Uh, there is certainly an association between um, these two diseases, but um, a, a very recent review article um, sponsored by the American Heart Association uh, uh, did not support, does not, uh, looking at um, meta-analysis 
uh, did find the, this strong association, but not a causal relationship. However, it didn't take into account um, microbiome variation, um, and it did it note that uh, short-term periodontal disease uh, treatment uh, decreases systemic uh, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction. Um, there's an error on this slide. This one is about um, a, a recent study in diabetes and periodontal disease. Um, uh, present studies uh, do support an association, uh, and it, that should read with type 2 diabetes. Uh, there was, un unfortunately, a duplication. We should, should and, and, and it supports um, a bidirectional causal relationship between periodontal disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, and so in, in our system, uh, we have um, nearly um, 2,000 diabetics who've had a dental visit within the last year, and uh, about 900 of them have not had a, um, um, a dental visit within the past year. So um, what, we, what, what this, uh, this population can help us do is uh, shown here. This is one of the, um, the um, short-term uh, demonstration type projects that we have. Um, it's it's uh, management of patients with both diabetes and periodontitis, and and it's um, our our um, dentists um, would refer patients who have periodontitis uh, to the clinic for um, type two diabetes testing and vice versa, um, and we feel that um, uh, together with. Um, uh, genetic and microbiome data, we could, we could stratify these patients and, and uh, come up with uh, more effective ways to, to treat both of these disorders. Um, um, among other uh, demonstration projects would be uh, pharmacogenetics related to the management of dental patients, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, pain management and coagulation management. Um, and so we're working on a pharmacogenetics panel uh, for, for a specific for dental patients and clinical decision support tools uh, tailored to uh, these medications uh, relevant to dental work in, in a uh, integrated electronic health record, integrated between our electronic health record and electronic dental record. Um, this is uh, what our electronic dental record looks like. And it may, it's probably difficult to see, uh, but in the bottom uh, left panel, there's an alert box um, that um, you know, talks about uh, medications and such. This is where the pharmacogenetics data would be and where uh, referrals, say, from our dentists to, um, to our clinicians would be in, in case of periodontal disease uh, findings. And um, these, uh, many of these um, ideas have uh, recently been published in um, uh, the journal Oral Diseases. Uh, one we recently published um, uh, talking about our personalized medicine model uh, at the Marshfield Clinic, and, and one that was published um, uh, a few months ago by Jeff Ginsburg's group, um, and they're shown here for, for, for your reference. And uh, recently, NIDCR uh, awarded about $67 million in a seven-year grant uh, towards a national dental practice-based research network. Um, this is to University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Dentistry. Uh, we, uh, Marshfield Clinic supported this application and will we'll join this Midwest regional node of, of this uh, network. But we will also continue our efforts to form a national network of, of like-minded institutions across the country to establish a large and diverse cohort of dental medical patients uh, with electronic health records, electronic dental records, and oral microbiome uh, samples. And if anyone's interested, there's uh, contact information at the bottom shown in red. So, um, and that's, I try to be very quick. So, um, I, I'll, I'll stop here for any questions that you may have. Questions? Murray is single-handedly driving this, and <laughs> and and you know it's going to happen. So I, I I do really think that um, you know by taking into account um, 
the effects of the microbiome, uh, we will be able to stratify a number of patients that previously you know, genetics alone doesn't doesn't um, doesn't uh, give us such significant data. So, okay, if there's Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to ask um, you or maybe um, uh, Joanne and Iomi uh, whether um, the dental environment you feel is a, um, an environment that actually will facilitate uh, some of the genomics research in ways that the medical environment cannot, particularly from a payer um, point of view. Yeah, I would just say that um, at least from an Aetna research perspective, there's actually a lot of collaboration with Columbia Dental School over this connection of, of uh, oral health and cardiovascular disease, and I've been involved in the uh, preterm birth connection of it. So my questions were, you know, you could also look at this in the prenatal care arena. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, um, the, the, um, the, in fact, um, the Marshfield Clinic opened up dental clinics because we, we noted that our population, which is essentially indigent and rural, um, lacked uh, dental care. We had patients coming in that hadn't been to the dentist in many, many years, and were having, um, you know, uh, we saw lots of type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, et cetera. So the, the uh, clinic invested in opening up uh, now eight different um, rural dental clinics throughout northern and central Wisconsin to serve people who otherwise weren't getting dental care because of really poor reimbursement um, Medicare type rates. Mm -hmm. So, Marie, I'm wondering if you could comment maybe on, on what you're learning from the microbiome or is this, you, you haven't done it yet and you're hoping to, to learn, but, but maybe give us a feel for, for how that will contribute. Right. So, so right now we, we have not analyzed the, the any, anything yet. We've, we've, um, we have probably about a dozen uh, microbiome samples, a uh, dozen individuals with microbiome samples. Uh, currently collected, so I, I can't really comment on, on what we're finding yet, but that it, it won't be long, I, I suppose. Deborah. And, and also, I'd just like to mention that um, uh, among the other, um, other interested um, people in this, uh, in this group, um, uh, uh, Mount Sinai is already collecting um, um, uh, actually significant numbers of patients with microbiome samples. So do you imagine that testing the microbiome, I mean, sequencing all the organisms, will, will move into clinical care, or will you do research that identifies certain characteristic organisms that then would be just targeted testing? Well, I think that the, it, it, my understanding is what's emerging are, are um, sort of microbiome communities and, and certain subtypes of communities. And some of those are more associated with disease than others, um, periodontal disease being one of those. So, yeah. But in clinical care, do you have to do the whole microbiome? Or can you just look for characteristic organisms within the community that predicts the disease risk? Right. It's, it, what, you, what you look for is, is um, it's, it's not a single, um, a single microorganism, but, but sort of... Uh, you can classify it by the presence of, of several uh, types. So um, my understanding is there's, there's three or four major microbiome types. So you imagine that in clinical care we will need to sequence the microbiome and that's the only way to do this testing in clinical care? Um, maybe Erwin has a, you, you had a comment? No, no, I just uh, wanted to signal oh, to the chair. I, that you know, I, you know, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a comment that to, to to speaks to your question. I, I think that um, mic the, yeah, my mic's on. Uh, um, I think that the um, uh, uh, th there's a lot of interest uh, amongst uh, um, the microbiology community uh, in, in the possibility that sequencing is going to be going to replace culture for uh, 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 the speciation of both the bacteria and viruses in the microbiology lab. The leader in this area is uh, George Weinstock at uh, uh, WashU. He's actually doing whole genome sequencing. And, and in the pathology community, I think there's a lot of interest. You probably know these people. Lynn Bree at our place is the person that's most interested in it. 
Uh, but, but, but so I, I think that, uh, uh, y you know, in my view, actually, next to cancer, this is one of the areas where it, there's the potential for a huge impact of sequencing uh, uh, in terms of clinical practice. I think there's a lot of hurdles that are going to have to be overcome in terms of the time it takes to speciate and uh, uh, so on and so forth, and how do you store the data and, and, and everything else. I think on the research side, uh, y you know, my own particular interest, and I, I think there's a a lot of evidence to support this, that uh, uh, um, in autoimmune disease, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the development of, uh, um, of asthma, which is the disease I'm most interested in, uh, how human beings tolerize is a function of what the microbiome is at birth. And uh, for both obesity and for asthma, there's elevated risk that's associated with C-section that those of us that are studying this think is related to the fact that these infants are not exposed to the microbiome as part of the birth process, and that this is a process that's set relatively early in life. And so we're actually testing the hypothesis that uh, they're, they're <clears throat> the fetal microbiome may be uh, a risk factor for the development of autoimmune disease and specifically asthma. So I think there's research implications, but there are also clinical implications. And the way we would be looking at this is, is really um, is sequencing 16S uh, uh, RNA, and, and um, that, that's, that's one of the, the major techniques for determining the species, yeah. Yeah, just to follow up very briefly with a comment on, on Scott's uh, statement, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, our group here at on Sinai is very, very involved in the pathogen characterization uh, using sequencing, and that's certainly something going to be very big. Mary, I was interested in uh, your current inclusion criteria. Is it diabetes only, or are you also extending to pre-diabetes, which could be very, very interesting from a research point of view, and then adding microbiome as a predictor? Right. So, so what we're doing in, in the rec recruitment process is as these people come in, um, they, uh, we, we take a fasting blood sample to look at, at, at you know, at the time of, that they're recruited, uh, what their uh, blood sugar is. Uh, we also um, uh, look at a hemoglobin A1C status and, and such. And then because they're part of the Marshfield Clinic system, we can, we can look back and we can look forward uh, for their diabetic status. So it's not, we, we don't know whether they have diabetes when, when they come in uh, to the clinic, so, so that's not one of the recruitment criteria. Karis? So I, I also want to emphasize that we're sequencing our DNA and not the whole microbiome, and it's, right. it's pretty quick, but again, the 454 sequencing versus Sanger sequencing arguments coming out because what we have found, and we look at head and neck cancers, is that um, in head and neck cancers versus healthy people, the oral microbiome is less diverse in disease, and that diversity is hidden with 454 sequencing, because with Sanger sequencing, you're going to actually subspeciate better. And the consortium microbiome might actually change somatic methylation of certain genes, which is what we've found is inflammation in the immune system, and it also changes the metabolome, and sometimes it's the metabolome that promotes whatever the disease is. Yes, yes, well, thank you. You, so, Marie, thank you. Uh, 